Hello everybody, we have this 44th chapter called The Great Days of the Arabs from this wonderful book called uh, Short Story, A Short History of the World by H.G. Wells. So we have the 44th chapter, The Great Days of the Arabs. My name is V. Narendra Kumar and we are from NRK Academy. The Great Days of the Arabs. There follows the most amazing story of conquest in the whole history of our race. The Byzantine, Byzantine uh, army was smashed at the Battle of Yarmouk, a tributary of the Jordan in 634, and the Emperor Heraclius was his energy sapped by dropsy and his resources exhausted by the Persian War, saw his new conquests in Syria, Damascus, Palmyra, Antioch, Jerusalem and the rest fall almost without resistance to the Muslim. Large elements in the population went over to Islam. Then the Muslim turned east. The Persians had found an able general in Rustam. They had a great host with a force of elephants and for three days they fought the Arabs at Cadesia and broke at last in headlong rout. The conquest of all Persia followed and the Muslim Empire pushed far into western Turkestan and eastward until it met the Chinese. Egypt fell almost without resistance to the new conquerors who full who, full of a fanatical belief in the sufficiency of the Quran, wiped out the vestiges of the book copying industry of the Alexandria Library. The tide of conquest poured along the north coast of Africa to the Straits of Gibraltar and Spain. Spain was invaded in 710 and the Pyrenees mountains were reached in 720. In 732, the Arab advance had reached the center of France, but here it was stopped for good at the Battle of Poitiers and thrust back as far as the Pyrenees again. The conquest of Egypt had given the Muslim a fleet and for a time it looked as though they would take Constantinople. They made repeated sea attacks between 672 and 718, but the great city held out against them. The Arabs had little political aptitude and no political experience and this great empire with its capital now at Damascus which stretched from Spain to China was destined to break up very speedily. From the very beginning, doctrinal differences undermined its unity. But our interest here lies not with the story of its political disintegration, but with its effect upon the human mind and upon the general destinies of our race. The Arab intelligence had been flung across the world even more swiftly and dramatically than had the Greek a thousand years before. The inte intellectual stimulation of the whole world west of China, the breakup of old ideas and development of new ones was enormous. In Persia, this fresh, excited Arabic mind came into contact not only with Manichaean, Zoroastrian and Christian doctrine, but with the scientific Greek literature preserved not only in Greek, but in Syrian translations. It found Greek learning in Egypt also. Everywhere and particularly in Spain, it discovered an act Jewish tradition of speculation and discussion. In Central Asia, it met Buddhism and the material achievements of Chinese civilization. It learned the manufacture of paper, which made print printed books possible from the Chinese. And finally, it came into touch with Indian mathematics and philosophy. Very speedily, the intolerant self-sufficiency of the early days of faith, which made the Quran seem the only possible book, was dropped. Learning sprang up everywhere in the footsteps of the Arab conquerors. By the 8th century, there was an educational organization throughout the whole Arabized world. In the 9th, learned men in the schools of Cordoba in Spain were corresponding with learned men in Cairo, Baghdad, Bukhara and Samarkand. The Jewish mind assimilated very readily with the Arab and for a time the two Semitic races worked together through the medium of Arabic long after the political breakup and enfeeblement of the Arabs, this intellectual community of the Arab-speaking world endured. It was still producing very considerable results in the 13th century. So it was that the systematic accumulation and criticism of facts which was first begun by the Greeks was resumed in this astonishing renaissance of the Semitic world the seed of Aristotle and the Museum of Alexandria that had lain so long inactive and neglected now germinated and began to grow towards fruition. Very great advances were made in 
mathematical, medical and physical sciences. The clumsy Roman numerals were ousted by the Arabic figures we use to this day and the zero sign was first employed. The very name algebra is Arabic. So is the word chemistry. The names of such stars as Algol, Aldebaran and Butes preserve the traces of Arab conquest in the sky. Their philosophy was destined to reanimate the medieval philosophy of France and Italy and the whole Christian world. The Arab experimental chemists were called alchemists and they were still sufficiently barbaric in spirit to keep their methods and results secret as far as possible. They realized from the very beginning what enormous advantages their possible discoveries might give them and what far-reaching consequences they might have on human life. They came upon many metallurgical and technical devices of the utmost value. Alloys and dyes, distilling, tinctures and essences, optical glass. But the two chief ends they sought, they sought in vain. One was the philosopher's stone, a means of changing the metallic elements into one another and so getting a control of artificial gold. And the other was the elixir vito, a stimulant that would revivify um, uh, re age and prolong life indefinitely. The crabbed, patient experimenting of these Arab alchemists spread into the Christian world. The fascination of their inquiry spread. Very gradually, the activities of these alchemists became more social and cooperative. They found it profitable to exchange and compare ideas. By insensible gradations, the last of the alchemists became the first of the experimental philosophers. The old alchemists sought the philosopher's stone, which was to transmute base metals to gold and an elixir of immortality. They found the methods of mod modern experimental science which promise in the end to give man illimitable power over the world and over his own destiny. And that is such a beautiful chapter. And the next chapter is 45th chapter, the development of Latin Christendom. 45th chapter is the development of Latin Christendom and the development of Latin Christian. And this we'll do in the next video. Thank you so much.